about to see here. So, this is some of the Digibarn collection. And this is a mouse from Doug Engelbart's group. It was part of NLS. Yeah. At SRI in yeah. 67. So that's NLS uh, in its earlier rendition. I have so. a Doug Engelbart story. You do? Yeah, we were over at his house. <laughs> that's all good stories happen. But he goes into his uh, bedroom <laughs> and pulls out a Nikon 50 F14 box. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Sits it on the table. And he pulls the original mouse out of the box. Yeah. Like, not oh. not the prototypes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Like mm. Not the prototype that were, but the real one. And I'm like, what the fuck is this doing in your house, man? This is like <laughs> this a natural. A this is, no, this belongs not just in a museum, in Smithsonian, right? And now mm. it is. But, so uh, they made about a dozen for NLS, and this is uh, one that had a matching key for set. recording. Cord key set, yeah, and this is connected to what's called the line sequencer. So they added later cabling, but that's an original Bill English. So, so Bill English, I brought this over to him once, and he, he typed 24 words a minute on this key set. But that's that's measured so that it's his forearm length going in the platen, you know, for the NLS. And then there's some more here. So there's a lot more in the barn when we'll go down and look at it. What, uh, one thing I think about is camera. Yeah. People are going to be in VR headsets soon inside this camera, right? And they're, so they're going to be able to watch this video mm -hmm. and be here and see what you're showing us. So this is actually one of the original Cray books from Friedlander, who's the famous depression photographer. Yeah. Who photographed Americans at work. So it was a... There's only a few of these, but this was his documentation of Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, where the Cray 1 was made. And it's interesting because this is Chippewa Falls, standard American town in the late 70s, right? And then, it says it's funny, and it has the highest tech company in the world. There's Seymour Cray, and the residents of Chippewa Falls making the world's most advanced computer at the time. The Cray One in this case. When Apple bought their uh, cr first Cray, it was on the front page of the Mercury News newspaper. It was such a big deal. And so I have two Crays in the barn. I have the Cray One and the prototype of the Cray Two. So that's the Cray book. And then this, this is extraordinary. So this was so. Uh, so in the mail when I was in the middle of my PhD came this uh, set of documents. And I didn't know what they were. I didn't even open them up for the first few months. And then I realized when I did open them, this is the Shep DOS for the Apple II. So explain what that is. So because Shep, people don't remember Apple II days. This right. Is so when this I was is 13 a, years old. <laughs> this, is a, this is an order form for the Apple II, advance order information from the Byte Shop, from Apple on Welch Road. So this is their mar first marketing literature really uh, written by Steve Jobs and then the problem that they had in the first year is that it was only a cassette interface for the Apple II which was unreliable and yeah. it's crap and so Steve needed a, a real operating system for floppy disks fast and no one could write it there were five people in the company and so down the hall in the building at Welch Road was a uh, Shepherds and Microsystems, and there was a guy in there named Bill Shepherdson, and he had an incredibly good microcoder crack guy named Paul Lawton. Yeah. And they sat in the booth at the Good Earth restaurant and made a deal that Paul would write the OS for the Apple II. And so Steve came by his office and put 24K into his Apple II, and then he started writing it. And this is the system contract. But I noticed you said K. Yeah. <laughs> not megabytes, not gigabytes. So, so here, here's, the order, here's the order for it. April 10th, 78. Uh, Apple II operating system, file manager, basic interface, utilities for $13,000. Yeah. In 1976 dollars. $78. Way, dollars. Yeah. 1978 dollars. That's the system contract. And le legal people love that because, like, that's it. That's the system contract. Wow. Um, and then this is all the rest of the correspondence. So 
<clears throat> Paul was Paul sent me this. He didn't know what to do with it, so he said, "Do you want it?" And so here's like Apple DOS modifications by 620 1978 $1500. And this is the change orders for changes to the OS. There's a letter to Steve, there's letters to Waz, and then here's the tech spec. So Bandley Drive. Yeah, so here's and that's when they went from Welch to Bandley Drive. Yeah. So here's this is uh Welch Paul's was, writing was his garage or his parents' garage? No, it was just another office. office. Another office. Yeah. And this is the this is Waz's handwriting. So what Waz did was he he had created the floppy controller working with Bill Fernandez over set customs of seventy seven. Yeah. And they had cranked it out, but they couldn't write an OS. So they, when Paul came into the project, this is this is the boot sector for the Apple II floppy. And this is Fernandez's chip design for this is Fernandez's layout, Waz's layout. One one th uh, three seventy eight January seventy eight for the board. And so there's the board, which ran two floppies. Two floppies in one. It's a sector map, timing, and they had to so write company. My dad bought one of those floppies. <laughs> this is a, so, <laughs> that was a great day because no more loading. For and this tape, is the hand handwritten boot code. Actually, this is the boot code for it. Wow. And then here's the actual code. So this is the actual listings of the Apple II DOS. So this is. This is and, how Apple did it. And notice it's sitting on top of an Altair. Yeah. Computer. I've got everything, believe me. So this, that's the symbol table. So this was built based upon um, IBM design principles, which is kind of ironic. But Paul was a, was a brilliant, this is his Shep Apple DOS. Paul was a brilliant uh, software engineer. And this is just bursted. So this was written on a national semiconductor machine, put, punched out onto paper tape, and then loaded into the Apple II with a custom interface. So they didn't have a floppy, so then it had to be written to the floppy, so then they could load it from the floppy to see if it would run in the Apple II. And it's got, it's full of, it's full of uh, his comments, too. So we did a restoration in 2013 on this whole thing, working with the Computer History Museum, and, and we got it, they hand typed this thing in. And then they assembled it, and it booted a real Apple II, and then they disassembled the delivered code, which is that, to compare it line for line and put Paul's comments back in to restore the original comments to the shipping. It was just crazy. It was like a really nerdy project, right? And then me and Waz and Mark, Mike Markula, yeah. you know who Mike Markula is, First right? First investor. In right. Yeah. Most powerful guy in the Valley for many years. He worked with Len Schustek, so this is what we did. Uh, so Steve, uh, Steve was gone. Uh, it had taken two years to get the Mac Paint source code released, just for public, for historians, and we didn't want that to happen. So one day, uh, Waz, I had Waz write an email to the General Counsel Bruce Sewell. I don't know if you know these names, but a little bit. At at 11.20 a.m., where we knew he was sitting in front of his Mac. And then Markala wrote an email that came in like 30 seconds later, so we were together. So basically, Sewell looked at that and thought it was an order. So he turned around and he wrote the release for this, like right there, himself. He didn't send it to his department, his group. And after lunch, we got the release, so we said we want it this for historical purposes of release to the public domain and, and you did it we did it and when we met we liked to high five because it was to get that through Apple legal that was what we needed the chairman of the board writing and was writing at the same time hitting him at that fat time he wrote the release himself so it was like a high five moment so this wow. code got released so that people could study it VisiCalc was based on this the first you know successful uh, um, you know, word process and everything. And so by having this code, we could actually look at what Frankston did to get VisiCalc to run. Because it was released in October of 79, and it was a, it made the Apple II into a business thing, right? Yeah. It was a revolution. Yeah. So that's the Apple DOS. So that's how Apple booted up.
Because it comes. That's the beginning of Apple right there in a folder. It is amazing. Because they would have died on the vine. As usual, they had a beautiful machine and they had incomplete manufacturing and support. I know. You know, as usual. Do you know what I did around that time? I built Apple II for my mom because they ran out of manufacturing and I was hired Hildy Lick to build the motherboards. And my mom worked for Hildy Lick. Oh my god. And uh, Waz told me that those boards were built better than the factory built them. <laughs> so it, you know? That, I got paid allowance to load the boards. <laughs> it all, I have, I have, uh, I'll show you some other stuff. So this, this is a fully loaded Altair 800 signed by many of the homebrew members. This is serial number 16, unassembled, that we were given in the box. It was never taken out of the box since it was sent in 1975, March of 75. So that's the oldest Altair that's in existence. Wow. And this is fully loaded, and we use that to play Fool on the Hill and stuff. <laughs> so, you know, it was, and, and I mean, we use it for demos for events, like for restoration events. For, for people who don't know who you are, since I doubt very, much, very many people around the world who watch this video... <laughs> We'll know who you are. Who are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm Dr. Bruce Damer, and I'm a scientist and collector geek and author, and I work on Origin of Life. I work on spacecraft design. There's some of the spacecraft innovations there. I've done 20 years of work for NASA. I've come up with a new model hypothesis for how life began on Earth, which is now spreading around the world based on operating system bootstrap principles, based on that. So I went into the science of origin of life and applied computing, complexity theory, bootstrap to put it together with Dave Deemer from DCSC. <coughs> now, so how did we all start? How we all started, exactly. How did we? Wet, dry cycling of hot spring pools with meteoritic infall. I can show you the uh, stromatolites to prove it. Um, created protocells out of the membranes that were in solution that were compressing down during the dry bathtub film and, and making polymers out of the monomers and then they would butt off and you get trillions of them. It's a combinatorial system and it selects the ones that stabilize their protocell. And we now have done it in the lab for years and we've done it in hot springs. So we, so we started in something that, like Yellowstone. Yes, uh, jacuzzi. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We started not in the, in the oceans because you just thermodynamically uphill. You can't get polymers to form in the ocean environment. But so you needed an asteroid to come and hit that little pool. To yeah, make you it need all happen. Uh, during the early Earth, and I can't show you this stuff. But during the early Earth, there was a huge protoplanetary disk that was very dusty, and the Earth was was vacuuming material up and concentrating it in huge amounts of organics. Some of the asteroids we'll go after will be packed. Because we're going to turn them into biospheres so people can feed in space. And we should tell people that you're um, planning a company to mine asteroids. Man asteroids, do satellite servicing, open the solar system. Because if you know, none of these guys like Elon and whatnot have a hope of doing what they want to do if they don't have fueling stations everywhere. They need refueling. They need gas mineral extraction. And asteroids, you can't throw cables around them or bolt things onto them. They're dangerous, friable rubble piles. But you can put an atmosphere around them in a helium balloon enclosure. Manage them, move them, extract from them, chemically alter them. It's the way to do it. It's making small worlds. So it allows, in a sense, Gaia to reproduce. You know, the biosphere has a future path if it starts dividing. Right? And that's what we're for. We're the divisionary reproductive organs. Otherwise, or we're just eating hamburgers and you know, publishing fake news or something. What else are we good for? But if we can allow... We're good at that. <laughs> that. And that's all part of probably the division process. So I've got samples of 3.5 billion year old uh, meat, uh, stromatolites over why here. You, why don't you come on over here? And this is what uh, Carlos wanted to get a selfie with. This is one of my ancestors. It was a sea captain in the 1600s sitting next to... So this is what I picked up in Australia. With this camera, you don't need a selfie, by the way. Oh, yeah, right. It's, it's, it's 360 degrees, yeah. <laughs> so, so what is this that you're holding? So Carlos can hold it. So that's a 3 billion-year-old um, chunk of rock that's made by 
the laying down of microbial mats on a lake shore three billion years ago. It's called a stromatolite. And it's <coughs> the oldest evidence for life on Earth. Wow. And then in this little vial here, yeah, that, that, that one is awesome. That, this one is mind bending. Yeah, so this is an extract, you see that little bit on the bottom, of the Murray meteorite, which is 4.6 billion years old. Fell on the Earth. It's a carbonaceous chondrite. It's crammed with organics. It was what was feeding the system. If you smell it. Wow. That's smell, a very different smell than I've ever smelled before. Yeah, it's a very deep, smoky. That's five billion years of depth. It's, it's like a rock me metallic smell, mm -hmm. but uh, old, dusty. Yes, kind of yeah. And that's your fault. Your, your smelling polystic really like aromatic hydrocarbons which break down into all these building blocks. And there's no amino acids and fat. You can see the fatty acid membranes on the side. So that's the building blocks of, of life. You just smell the uh, most vintage perfume that you'll probably ever, ever get to smell, smell in your life. Because this was preserved for 4.6. It's older than Earth. Like Earth formed about 4.57 billion years ago. And this is older. And so that's... There's a number of other things. Yeah. That's Mars 2020, which I'm on the landing site. I was for. just seeing them put that together last week. Uh, you were? You were? Yeah. yeah. I was on the third landing site committee group for that week to pick our, our landing site. Um, so now there's more. I mean, there's the, there's stuff down in the barn. And there's whole collections of... Yeah, we'll go down, down there and walk down through Yeah, that. absolutely. Let me just... All right. Stop this for now.